Welcome to Lecture 1 of ECE 4305, Software-Defined Radio Systems and Analysis. In this lecture, we will go over some of the logistical information for this course, as well as get a general overview of what is digital communications. For this course, we will be using the textbook, Digital Communication Systems Engineering with Software-Defined Radio, by D. Poo and Alexander M. Wiglinski, published by Arctic House in January 2013. This textbook contains a wealth of fundamental knowledge, mathematical tools, as well as software examples and hands-on experiments using software-defined radio, as well as end-of-chapter questions and applications of software-defined radio in today's world. This, this course will follow very closely the content of this textbook. It is recommended that anybody taking this course has a basic understanding of digital communication techniques such as equalization, synchronization, and modulation, among many other concepts. Furthermore, a basic understanding of probability is very much recommended, especially when conducting the error performance of digital communication systems. Since we will be actually implementing communication systems using software-defined radio, using the Simulink software tool by the MathWorks, Familiarity with this graphical programming language is very much important. Finally, familiarity with general programming techniques and an understanding of how programs execute on computer platforms is very important for this course. We divide this course into five segments. The first segment, Digital Signaling and Data Transmission, focuses on how we translate digital information, ones and zeros, into analog waveforms that get communicated across a medium, such as air or a fiber optic cable or a copper wire. Next, we'll be using the concepts of probability theory in order to quantitatively analyze the error performance of these digital communication systems when they're corrupted by noise. We'll then look at various types of receiver structures that are designed to minimize receiving or decoding uh, intercepted signal and error, including correlator realizations, match filter realizations, and also look at techniques for creating these realizations such as orthonormal basis functions and the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process. We'll then look at multi-carrier data transmission, which is widely used in broadband data transmission techniques such as Wi-Fi, several cellular communication standards, as well as DSL modems. Orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, or OFDM, is a very common form of this type of multi-carrier data transmission. Finally, we will look at spectrum sensing and identification techniques, trying to understand how to locate the, the, lo uh, the presence of a signal in frequency spectrum as well as be able to identify what type of signal is being in, uh, transmitted in the first place. So what is digital communications? Well, digital communications is when we try and take digital data, ones and zeros, and be able to communicate it from one location to another across a medium. In particular, what we try and do is we try and translate this digital data into an analog waveform. And in particular, analog waveforms that are in uh, uh, the electromagnetic frequency range. So what we are trying to do is, how do we map digital data or groupings of digital data, like a pattern of ones and zeros, into a single unique waveform that completely characterizes that pattern of ones and zeros and then successfully communicate that across a medium to an intended receiver. And the waveforms that we'll be using in this course, and what is, is used extensively in the wireless communications and just in digital communications world in general, are sine and cosine waves, which operate in electromagnetic frequencies. And the degrees of freedom for each cosine and sine waveform is amplitude, phase, and frequency. So what digital data transmission is all about is mapping those ones and zeros into a unique amplitude, phase, and or frequency value that essentially is the fingerprint 
of that binary pattern, such that if a receiver intercepts that signal and sees that waveform, it can then decode, hopefully successfully, what that binary pattern is. Now, what we want to do is since the binary information is coming at a fixed rate of time, and we take a fixed number of these binary digits and create a unique waveform. Suppose we take n of these binary digits and translate them into a single uh, analog waveform. Assuming that it takes t seconds to, to, to receive n of those binary digits or bits, we then have what we call our symbol period t. And that symbol period essentially is the duration of time that that waveform uniquely represents that specific pattern of bits. So every t seconds, we expect a different waveform that represents a different pattern of n bits. So let's take an example of mapping bits to analog waveforms. Suppose we have the input sequence 10110010. First of all, uh, it's not necessarily uh, the case that we normally uh, take one bit and map it to one unique waveform. Sometimes we can take groupings of bits and map them to a unique waveform. And uh, usually the rule of thumb is if you want a, um, a comprehensive set of unique waveforms that uh, each uh, uniquely maps to a specific binary pattern, okay, consisting of n bits, we usually use the rule of having, if we have like, let's say n bits per unique code word or symbol um, or waveform, um, we get uh, two DDN um, unique waveforms that are needed and represent those n bits. So n is the number of bits um, in, in, in that, that grouping of bits that we want to map to a unique waveform. So in this case, if let's say we let n equals two, that means we need to have four unique waveforms to represent all possible combinations of two bits uh, per waveform. So uh, what we would do is we would take each pair and say, okay, let's represent this in terms of an analog waveform. And there are several ways we can do this. Uh, let's, let's try three basic ones. The first is to use the amplitude of a sine wave, say, to represent uh, each pair of bits. So over time, let's say it takes t seconds to, uh, to, to, uh, for, to have two bits ready for conversion into an analog waveform. What we would do is we would have, let's say we'd break it down this timeline into intervals of t, big T, seconds. And say we have a sine wave. Um, if we represent each binary pattern by unique amplitude level, we would have something that looks like this. Okay, so what do we have here? Well, we have a sine wave that has the same phase and same frequency across all time, but the amplitude values over every t seconds changes based on the pair of binary digits that we want to convert into a unique waveform. In this case, one zero is represented by the amplitude A1. One one is represented by the amplitude A2. Zero zero is represented by the amplitude A3. And one zero again is represented by A1. Okay. So now suppose we want to represent things in terms of phase information, okay, where different phase uh, across each time interval represents a different binary sequence. So again, we break down into every t seconds. Our interval. And now what happens is we keep amplitude and frequency the same, but we transmit across each t seconds um, a sine wave with a different phase that represents speci that specific binary pattern. 
So what we've got here is constant amplitude across all time and the same frequency. But notice how this guy here is zero degrees out of phase. He's 45, uh, sorry, 90 degrees out of phase. This guy is like 180 degrees out of phase with the previous guy, right? And then we're back to zero degrees phase as in the first case. So, and, and usually if uh, we can see in the time domain these phase shifts at each transition point at every t seconds by these jumps, if you will, these discontinuities, these sudden jumps um, in the waveform. Last but not least, suppose we now manipulate the frequency of the sinusoid over time in each time instance. So 0, t, 2t, 3t, 4t. Okay. And now we keep amplitude and phase the same, but we now um, uh, play around with the frequency. Okay. So amplitude again is kept the same, phase is kept the same, but notice that at every t seconds we have a different frequency. We have a frequency here, say it's f, and that represents one zero. One one has two times that frequency. It has double the number of peaks and valleys. And then zero zero has half the frequency relative to one zero, and then finally that. And so what happens is we observe that over every time interval, whatever the frequency value is for that sine wave represents a specific binary pattern. In order to perform the, the mapping of bits to an analog waveform, there are several fundamental blocks that are contained in every digital communication transmitter and digital communication receiver. There is a binary source or sync, which essentially consists of the binary digits that are being generated and those that are being recreated at the receiver. Um, it might be interesting to note that these binary digits might come originally from an analog source, such as human speech or some sort of video process, and they get in turn quantized and digitized into ones and zeros. And that's, that would be our binary source. And then the sync would essentially be the result of those binary digits recreated at the receiver and then sent to some sort of encoder to translate it back into an audio file or a video file or try to represent what that analog signal that was in initially intercepted and translated into the binary data. In a lot of cases, we also do source encoding and decoding. And what that does is the, the, often a lot of this binary information that's, that's created contains a substantial amount of redundancy that can be extracted. It's almost like a zip file um, where we have like repetitions that can be somehow encoded uh, by some sort of keyword and we can essentially compress that information to just the bare essentials. Following the stripping out of the redundant information, we then might want to introduce some controlled redundancy in order to help make that transmission more robust to error. We call this channel encoding and decoding. At the transmitter, what we would do is we would introduce, let's say, a, some sort of controlled redundancy. Like, let's say, repeat every bit of the source encoded binary stream. Repeat every bit twice, such that, or such that if the bit is corrupted once, we can then recreate it knowing that we have its duplicate next to it. And at the receiver, we would then undo this red redundant channel encoding in order to give us the original binary sequence. Finally, once we've done the channel encoding, we then can modulate, basically translate that binary information into an analog waveform consisting of sines and cosines. And at the receiver, um, the opposite occurs where we demodulate an analog waveform of sines and cosines into its respective digital representation. The analog to digital and digital analog conversion is the step where we finally jump from the digital world into the analog world where we actually have real world signals communicated over the air, which is achieved by something called a radio frequency front end, which consists of power amplifiers, mixers, low noise amplifiers and oscillators and filters 
that enable us to transmit signals at carrier frequencies at, on the order of megahertz and even gigahertz. So suppose we look at um, more closely a block diagram of a communication system. Okay, so for, 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 this, um, for this schematic, let's look at the left side of this paper as the transmitter side, okay? Uh, the shorthand for it is uh, TX. And the right hand of the side is the receiver, or the RX. Uh, usually in digital communications, we don't really care about where the binary information comes from. It could be um, human speech, it could be a sound file, video file, sensory information that's all digitized into ones and zeros. So um, usually in the field, we use uh, the term binary source. Binary source in order to represent the stream the random streams of ones and zeros that are fed into our communication system likewise the goal is to get those ones and zeros with as few errors as possible the, the what i mean to say is when we receive that stream we hope to minimize the number of ones that have been accidentally transformed into zeros and the number of zeros transformed into ones such that it's received successfully by what we call a binary sink just like your kitchen sink it sucks in the the the, the bits and does whatever processing uh, afterwards like you know renders a video or an audio file out of it now um the first step is usually these binary streams have some amount of redundant information just like what you would have with a text file or some sort of image file like a bitmap um and we use file compression techniques in order to make zip files, which are much, much smaller in file size. Because what they do is they look for uh, patterns of ones and zeros and try and uh, uh, represent them by a code word, uh, thus reducing the size of the files because the code words are much smaller in size than the actual binary pattern. Um, same thing can be said in digital communications. We use something called source encoding. And those, that source encoder removes all those redundant patterns, leaving just the bare bones ones and zero binary pattern. Well, that pattern is uh, unintelligible um, by the binary sync, so we have to do source decoding at the receiver in order to successfully translate uh, that information back into a pattern ones and zeros that the binary sync can understand. Then, because the likelihood is there for our information to be corrupted along the way, we usually want to put in a controlled amount redundancy. Um, and we call this channel encoding. Um, and the channel encoder, what it does is it adds a controlled amount of redundancy in order to, um, uh, like, let's say if a, a bit is converted from, like, let's say it was a one and then it accidentally got flipped to a zero. What the channel encoder would do is there would be enough redundant information to reconstruct any corruption, corrupted bits back to the original state, thus minimizing the error that could be potentially introduced into transmission. Likewise, we, we need to remove that redundant, controlled redundancy at the receiver. So we use a channel decoder. And the channel decoder, in addition to removing that redundant information, also uh, checks to see if there are any errors and tries to correct them using that redundant information. So, so far we've been looking at binary information. Now, the next step is to translate it into those analog waveforms. And so we use modulation in order to convert it into, let's say, several signal properties, waveform properties, which is then fed into a digital to analog converter so we're still at baseband here, folks, right? So we, trans we create these waveforms, and then we need to convert from zero hertz to gigahertz or um, hundreds of megahertz in terms of the carrier frequency. And that requires a lot of analog processing using mixers and power amplifiers and uh, oscillators and uh, low noise amplifiers and the like. And we call this the radio frequency front end. And then we send it over the air using an antenna. Likewise, we have at the receiver a radio frequency front end and an antenna that intercepts these emissions from the transmitter, brings it down to eventually to zero hertz, to baseband, to DC, samples the waveform using an analog to digital converter, and then feeds it into the demodulator, 
before it goes through this process of conversion back into the binary, uh, hopefully the reconstructed binary sequence that we transmitted. So we've seen the basic building blocks that make a digital communication system. Although everything looks straightforward in terms of how we translate binary information into analog waveforms and communicate them over a medium only to be picked up by a receiver and then those waveforms get decoded back into their binary representation every t seconds. This problem is way more challenging than it appears. This is due primarily to what we call the channel, the medium that we're transmitting across, because unfortunately, although we hope that the only signal that will be in this medium will be the desired transmission that we hope to intercept at the receiver, there is something called noise which is unwanted signals that can potentially corrupt the transmission such that the receiver in the end can erroneously decode an, uh, the intercepted waveform into a binary pattern that might not be the correct one, the one that was not transmitted by the transmitter. So as a result, what we need to do and what this course will focus on is first of all, in addition to devising different types of modulation schemes, that help us represent in different scenarios binary information in terms of very specific types of analog waveforms. We also are going to use probabilistic techniques in order to quantify what is the probability of these errors, these bit errors of occurring when we introduce an unwanted signal that corrupts the transmission at the receiver. Following this, we'll actually look at receiver structures that will be able to, um, in many ways, try to minimize the probability of having these errors uh, through a variety of probabilistic techniques such as correlation, as well as match filtering, which is more of a signal processing approach. This concludes lecture one of ECE 4305.